What is the worst thing that can happen to an aircraft? The landing gear won't come down, engine failure, loss of airspeed indication? No, we can manage that. For me, the worst that can happen is a fire inside the aircraft. Hi, my name is Magnar Nordahl. I'm a captain and instructor on ATR aircraft. In this video, I will give a description of the fire protection systems in ATR aircraft. All variants are covered from the 42300 to the 72600. This video does not replace the training you will receive during a typewriting course or recurrent training, but it can serve as a supplement. I might have made mistakes, so if you find an error, please notify me in the comment sections below here. And I will write a note in the description panel. So please check it out before you watch the video. Finally, if there is a mismatch between this video and the manuals, then you must follow the manual. Enough said, let's dig into it. An engine fire can be caused by an oil leak or a fuel leak inside the engine compartment. In some incidents, one or more fuel nozzles have not been properly installed after inspection, resulting in a fuel leak. And the result will be like this. This aircraft experienced an engine fire shortly after takeoff. The crew stopped the engine, did the fire drill and landed safely. The engine fire detection system consists of sensing cables called loops. Two loops called A and B are installed in parallel inside each engine compartment. The outer surface of a loop is made of inconel, a nickel alloy used in high temperature applications. And a fun fact, the outer skin of the X15 is made of inconel. Inside the loop is a conductor, surrounded by a thermal sensitive material. The loops are connected to a fire detection control unit, located in the electric rack. There is one control unit for each engine. A small electrical current flows through the loops. In case of a fire, the loop will heat up, and the electrical resistance of the thermally sensitive material will drop. This causes the current to flow between the conductor and the outer shell. At the same time, will the capacitance in the loop increase. When both loops sense a temperature above 258 degrees Celsius, the engine fire warning is triggered. In variance with the glass cockpit, there will be a red engine fire alert plus a procedure which depends on the flight condition. Ground, takeoff or in flight. A short circuit in a loop will cause the resistance to drop, but the capacitance will remain unchanged. In this case, a loop fault alert is triggered. The loops on the fire detection system are tested with this switch before every engine start. And here is something very important to remember. If one loop has failed and the other loop senses a fire, the fire warning will not be triggered unless the fade loop has been switched off. In each wing fairing, there is a bottle filled with halon. That means there are two bottles in all, and they can be used for either engine. Agent 1 is the bottle on the associated engine side and bottle 2 is the bottle on the other side. Therefore, the bottle on the left side is number 1 for engine 1 and number 2 for engine 2 and vice versa. The bottles are armed when you pull the fire handle. Two squib lights will then illuminate. Each bottle has two lines, one to each engine. When you push the agent push button, the extinguished agent is released by a small explosive charge called squib. After a few seconds, an amber dish light is illuminated, 
indicated the bottle is empty. The scripts are tested by pressing this push button. And this is how we do a full engine fire test. Since engine number 2 has a propeller brake, it can be used as an APU, delivering electrical power and air conditioning while the propeller is not turning. This is called hotel mode. A temperature sensor is installed in a nacelle of that engine, that means the right engine. If the temperature reaches 170 degrees Celsius, a nacelle overheat warning is triggered. If the aircraft is in hotel mode, then engine 2 must be shut down. I never have heard about it happen during taxi, but we can get nacelle overheat after engine number 2 has been shut down and there is a tailwind. In that case, there is nothing to do because the engine is already shut down. Smoke on board is one of the worst scenarios a pilot can encounter. And the firm smoke does not only cover visible smoke, but also fumes or odors related to burning or evaporating materials. When smoke or fumes is present in the cockpit, the first action of the flight crew is to put on oxygen masks. The earlier the better, because smoke is toxic. The oxygen selector must be set to 100%, otherwise you will breathe oxygen mixed with ambient cabin air. Then put on the goggles if necessary, and establish communication. That means you put the headset back on. When you open the doors to the oxygen mask container, the microphone in the headset is isolated, and the microphone in the oxygen mask is activated. With the interphone active, your briefing in the mask is very loud, like Darth Vader in Star Wars. Therefore, you should set the transmitter selector to off and use the interphone only when you are talking. This is done by pushing the transmitter switch outwards. This procedure is applied if the smoke or fumes are observed in the cockpit. But this might be difficult to determine, so if you are in doubt, put on your oxygen mask. Next, switch off the recirculation fans. This will prevent the smoke from spreading through the cabin. And you must make sure that the autopilot is on, because it's very hard to fly manually when the cockpit is full of smoke. All actions I have mentioned until now have been performed by memory. Now it's time to find a checklist and identify the source of the smoke. Uh, let's start with the easy part. The cargo compartments and the lavatory have photoelectric smoke detectors, and they work in the following way. A light beam is aimed at the other end of a chamber. A light sensor is positioned at a 90 degree angle to the chamber and the light. A fan pulls air into the chamber. When the air is clear, the sensor is in the dark. When there is smoke in the chamber, the light is scattered and hits the sensor, triggering the alarm. Photoelectric smoke detectors are very good to detect smoke from smoldering fires. And this is exactly what you want in a cargo compartment. The photoelectric detector is also known as a photo-optical detector, or optical detector, a description used in older ATR manuals. The forward cargo compartment has a smoke detector in the ceiling. The fan can easily be heard when you are nearby. When smoke is detected, the following alert is triggered. After completing the smoke procedure, the procedure is to advise the cabin crew who will extinguish the fire. We select avionics vent exhaust mode to overboard and this will partially open the overboard valve and close the underfloor valve. Now the smoke will uh, escape through the forward part of the aircraft and it will not spread to the cabin. We select air condition to high flow, so we get more fresh air. And we close the extract airflow lever. This will prevent smoke from entering the cockpit. 
If you fly a cargo configuration, there is no cabin crew to extinguish the fire, and the procedure is not to suppress the fire by reducing the cabin pressure, thus diluting the oxygen content in the air. At the rear of the aircraft, there are two smoke detectors, one for the aft cargo compartment and one for the lavatory. The sensors are upstream of two fans. Only one fan is used at a time. If the normal fan fails, there is a fault light in the dispersion button, and the pilot can activate the second fan. When either of the sensors detects smoke, the following alert is triggered in the cockpit. The procedure is quite similar with the procedure for forward smoke, but the pilots don't know which of the smoke detectors is triggered. This information is only available to the cabin crew. On the cabin attendant panel, they will see whether the smoke is detected in the lavatory or in the aft cargo compartment. Cargo versions have four additional smoke detectors in the ceiling. Two of them are connected to the forward smoke alert and the other two are connected to the aft smoke alert. In the cabin, there are, depending on ATA variant, two or three handheld fire extinguishers, and local regulations might require more. One extinguisher contains water, and the other is halon. There is also a halon extinguisher in the cockpit. It is the job of the cabin crew to deal with the fires in the cabin and cargo compartments. And the cabin crew, together with the pilots, undergo regular training in firefighting. Since the aft cargo compartment is quite deep, it can be difficult to reach the rearmost bags. Above the aft cabin attendant seat, there is an orifice where the halon extinguisher can be inserted. The halon flows via two diffusers to the aft sections of the cargo compartment. Above the waste bin in the lavatory, there is an automatic fire extinguisher. It consists of a bottle with halon and it's activated when the temperature exceeds 77 degrees Celsius. In the FCOM, this system is called the avionics smoke detection, but the alert in the cockpit reads electrical smoke, so I will stick with that name. In the avionics extract duct, just before the extract fan, there is an ionization smoke detector. It's similar to most smoke detectors found in private homes. An ionization smoke detector consists of two electrically charged plates and a tiny amount of radioactive material, a Merisim-241. It emits alpha particles that ionize the air. A Merisim is safe as long as you don't ingest it. And the alpha radiation is so weak that it cannot penetrate a sheet of paper. Ionization means that an electron is knocked off from an atom. The negative electron is attracted to the plate to the positive charge, and the positive ion is attracted to the plate to the negative charge. This produces a small amount of electrical current between the plates. When smoke enters the chamber, it disrupts the flow of ions, reducing the current and activating the alarm. And again, the procedure is to do the smoke procedure, activate the avionics vent, exhaust mode, and increase the airflow in the air condition. Then, you start to reduce electrical loads. The DC service and utility buses are not essential and are shed. Then, you isolate the DC bus tie contactor. This is in a preparation if you later have to switch off one of the DC generators. Furthermore, we switch off both AC valve generators. Finally, we will search for a source of the smoke. Where is the smoke coming from? Are there any hotspots? Are there any tripped circuit breakers? If we can identify the source of the smoke, then it might be isolated. We have a halon extinguisher in the cockpit. And when you have identified the source, we can restore the other systems. If we cannot identify the source, or the fire cannot be controlled, 
And now I'm talking about all kinds of fires. We have to land as soon as possible. We cannot predict for how long we are able to control the aircraft when a fire is raging out of control. That might mean we have to land in a field or ditch in the water. And one more thing. The electrical fire warning might be triggered when smoke is evacuated from the forward cargo compartment or we have an air-conditioned smoke. This might be confusing, so you have to keep in mind the origin of the initial smoke. I have a video about an incident, look here, where the crew ended up making things much harder for themselves. I put a link in the description below here. The smoke detectors are tested before the first flight of the day. The test is performed by pushing and holding this button until you see all three smoke alerts. In addition, does the exhaust mode fault light illuminate, indicating that the extract fan has stopped. This prevents smoke from entering the cabin. The extract fan stops and aft smoke is triggered. When the smoke test is completed, and that means that all three alerts are extinguished, you must remember to reset the exhaust mode push button to restart the extract fan. Finally, we have the most common source of smoke on board, and that is the air conditioning system. With the exception of the Boeing 787, the air conditioning systems in airliners are fed with air from the engine compressors. If there is an oil leak in the engine compressor, the oil will vaporize and enter the air conditioning system. Therefore, air conditioning smoke might be an indication of an emerging engine problem. In ATA aircraft, the left air conditioning system is supplying the cockpit and the cabin, while the right air conditioning system is only supplying the cabin. So, if the cabin crew reports smoke in the cabin, but there is nothing in the cockpit, you will suspect the right air conditioning pack to be faulty. In the emergency checklist for smoke, there is a note. A lack of smoke may be activated by air conditioning smoke source. Therefore, when air conditioning smoke is confirmed, you must follow that procedure. This is important because the procedure for air conditioning smoke is very different from the other smoke procedures. First, you switch off one air conditioning pack. If that doesn't help, then you put it back on and switch off the other air conditioning pack. And there is a caution. Air conditioning smoke evacuation may trigger electrical smoke. Disregard it. The rest of the procedure is to monitor the associated engine and eventually shut it down if there is any abnormal indications. So how do we identify air conditioned smoke? First of all, it will come from the air vents. So make sure you know where the vents are located in the cockpit. The smoke might be almost invisible or it can be thick. Secondly, it smells like burned oil because that's what it is. This video, however, doesn't show air conditioning smoke but fog forming when cold air from the air conditioning system is mixed with warm, humid air in the cabin. This happens quite often when the doors are open and the air outside the aircraft is hot and humid. Okay, that's all for this time. And as I said in the beginning, if you notice any errors or if you have any questions, please let me know in the comment section below. Thank you for watching. Have a wonderful day and happy learning.